In the previous video, I introduced the idea of a linear transformation, something that preserved the linear operations of addition and scalar multiplication. Something that preserved the linear geometry of lines, planes, and other infinitely extended flat objects. Now I want to get into the theory of how to understand, use, and calculate these transformations. And I get to start with quite an amazing fact. I already know that matrices were a way to encode the data of a system of linear equations. They could also be used to check linear independence with row reduction. Matrices are already pretty useful objects. But for linear transformations, matrices again are the key. And this is the fact. Matrices perfectly encode linear transformations. Every linear transformation can be represented by a matrix, and every matrix uniquely defines a linear transformation. This is great, but how does it work? Well, a linear trans transformation is a function on vectors. It does something to vectors, sending them to other vectors. It acts on vectors. So if a matrix is a linear transformation, the matrix has to act on vectors. This is what I'll now define, the matrix action on vectors. For any matrix and any vector of the right length, the matrix acts on the vector. Let me demonstrate this in R2. A 2 by 2 matrix acts on a vector in R2. It does this by going across the rows of the matrix and down the vector. As I go across and down, I take the coefficients, pair them up, and multiply them together, a times x and b times y, and then I add them up. So the first entry of the vector action is ax plus by, across the first row and down the vector, and the second entry is the same by using the second row, cx plus dy, across the row of the matrix and down the column of the vector. The result is a new two-component vector. Each component came from a row of the original matrix. The same is true in R3, with a matrix acting on a three-dimensional vector. For each component, I go across the row of the matrix and then down the vector, multiplying and adding. The first component is from the first row in the vector, ax plus by plus cz. The second component is the second row in the vector, dx plus ey plus fz. And the third component is the third row in the vector, gx plus hy plus iz. And this produces a new three-dimensional vector. This is the matrix action. I'll get to some examples in a moment, but I do want to mention the general way to write this. Suppose that I have an M by N matrix, M rows and N columns. This matrix can be written with entries A, I, J, where the first index is the row and the second index is the column. An M by N matrix acts on a vector of length N. The length of the vector needs to match the number of columns of the matrix. Then for each row, I perform the same operation. I go across the row and down the vector, multiplying the coefficients together and adding it all up. The result is a vector of length m, one component for each row of the matrix. Note the m, n and m carefully. A matrix acts on vectors of length n, the number of columns. The output is a matrix of length m, the number of rows. All right, let's get a little bit more concrete. Let me go through some important examples of the matrix action. First, the zero matrix is the matrix of all zeros. In this action, since I multiply by the entries in the matrix and then add up, if all the entries are zero, all the multiplications are zero, and the result will be the zero vector. You can check this row by row if you wish. The first row gives zero times x plus zero times y plus zero times z, which is zero, and the next two rows are the same. As a transformation, the zero mat matrix sends everything to the zero vector. This is a linear transformation, even though it collapses everything to a single point. I also defined the identity matrix, the matrix with ones on the diagonal and zeros elsewhere. What does this matrix do? Well, look at the matrix action. The first row acts as one times x plus zero times y plus zero times z, which is just x. The second row acts as 0 times x plus 1 times y plus 0 times z, which is just y. And the third row acts as 0 times x plus 0 times y plus 1 times z, which is just z. The result is the same vector I started with. The identity matrix just, just gives you back what you had. It is like multiplying by 1. 
And this is why it is called the identity. The identity transformation is the transformation that doesn't do anything, that leaves the input the same in the output. What about a general diagonal matrix then? Recall that a diagonal matrix was a matrix with possibly non-zero entries on the diagonal but zeros elsewhere. What is the matrix action here? Well, the first two by going across and down is ax plus zero, y plus zero, z equals ax. The second row is zero x plus by plus zero, z, which is by. And the third row is zero x plus zero, y plus cz, which is cz. This matrix stretches or shrinks um, each entry. X is stretched by a factor of A, Y is stretched by a factor of B, and Z is stretched by a factor of C. This is called a dilation transformation. Each axis, axis is dilated by a factor. In the previous video, I talked about the composition of linear transformations. When the dimensions line up correctly, two linear transformations can be composed one after the other. Well, if linear transformations can be composed, and all linear transformations have matrices, then matrices can be composed. What is that process? It's a process known as matrix multiplication, and it uses an algorithm that we've already started to learn, going across the rows of the first matrix and down the rows, columns of the second, multiplying coefficients and adding these products together. Visually, I, I like to think of this as a dot product, for the left matrix A, I think of the rows as vectors. For the right matrix B, I think of the columns as vectors. Then the operation of going across a row and down a column, multiplying entries and adding the result together, is like a dot product of the row of the first matrix and the column of the second. Here, the first entry is u1 dot v1, the first row dot the first column, and the second entry of the outcome is u1 dot v2, the first row dot the second column. In this way, the entire new matrix can be filled in. Amazingly, this algorithm produces a new matrix which does represent the composition of the transformations. As always with composition, it is read from left to right. In this composition, AB represents the transformation that does B first and then A. Let me be more concrete again. Here are two square matrices, two by two matrices. These both represent transformations of R2 onto itself. Their composition is another transformation of R2 onto itself. To calculate it, I go across the rows of the first and down the columns of the second. The first entry in the product comes from the first row and the first column. One times two plus negative six times negative three is 20. Then the first row in the second column, 1 times 2 plus negative 6 times negative 5. Then the second row in the first column, negative 3 times 2 plus 0 times negative 3 is negative 6. And finally, the second row in the second column, negative 3 times 2 plus 0 times negative 5 is also negative 6. To finish this video, let me talk briefly about the properties of matrix multiplication. As with all the algebraic operations defined in this course, once I have defined it, I want to know how it works, what properties it has. This is the abstract mathematical question. How does this new thing behave? Well, say that I have three matrices with sizes k by l, l by m, and m by n. Then the composition ABC makes sense since the dimensions line up, l for a times b and m for b times c. The composition is associative. I can bracket the multiplication in any way. The identity matrix is usually written I, often with a subscript to indicate the size. So I sub L is the L by L identity matrix and I sub K is the K by K identity matrix. The identity matrix leaves vectors alone and it does the same for matrix multiplication. To compose with the identity matrix just gives the original matrix back. For A to match the dimensions, I can compose with the L by L identity matrix on the right or the K by K identity matrix on the left. In either case, I get the original back. Finally, matrix multiplication is not commutative. I'll talk about this in future videos, but the non-commutativity of matrix multiplication is one of its most important properties, and I'll get into the reasons for this in the future.